be with the, well with them that fear God, which fear before him. What's the next verse? But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. I don't care how much it looks like they're getting away with it. Don't tell me it's okay for a man to dress like a woman. Deuteronomy 20. Let's get into the judgment of God today. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. What does the Bible say about a a woman looking like a man in a man's apparel and and a man in a woman's apparel? I come to preach about the judgment of God today, brothers and sisters. The woman shall not not wear that which pertaineth. Look at that word, pertaineth. That means even gives the appearance that it's man's apparel. Now, brothers and sisters, if I got up here in a miniskirt and a set of pumps and a halter top, 90 some percent of you, sadly 100 percent should get up. But some of you are so caught up in the ignorance of this world, you'd sit here and try to make excuses while I can do that. That is a desecration of the house of God. If I got up here dressed like that, you would say that is being a transvestite. So why is it all right for ladies to wear britches like a man wears? That which even looks like men's apparel. Neither shall a man put on woman's garment for all who do so. I didn't say that. I'm going to tell you something. God don't change his mind. And the best thing you can do is quit finding people that justify your sin. Because we are going to stand before God. And it's his word that's going to judge us. I came to preach to this church this morning. That holiness and separation still matter in the mind of God. Sister, don't come and tell me, well, I can't do that and wear a dress. If you can't do that and be holy, then it ain't worth doing. Come on, this is what the church has always taught. Well, people make fun of me. I just read to you about the reproach. I'm going to go back there here in a minute. Happy is he when he is reproached for living in the commands of God. Now I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. I don't, know why, I don't know why in an apostolic church when I preach like this that it gets tight. It shouldn't. There should be enough apostolic people that are sold out to Jesus Christ when this kind of preaching goes on. There ought to be enough sisters around here that have been set free from that kind of lifestyle. Hold your place right there. Go to Psalms. What is it? Psalms 19. Let's go to Psalms 19. And let's see the attitude of somebody that loves the word of God. Psalms 19 and verse number 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show forth his handiwork, or showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Go on. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. And them hath he set the tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridge cometh out of the chamber and rejoiceth as strong men to run a race. Is going forth from the end of the heaven. Get to where it says the law of the Lord is perfect. Verse 7. I don't have time to read the whole chapter. For the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. I'm going to tell you something. If the law hadn't converted you, sister, you need to trip back up to this altar. 
The law brings conversion, not argument, not justification on why it's all right for me to disobey the word of God. Hey, brother, there is no excuse for you to have long hair. Now, I don't have to worry about it too much. I'm losing mine. What are you doing, Brother Elder? I hadn't got there yet, but judgment begins at the house of God. And I'm going to tell you something. You want God to judge you here. You don't want God to judge you at the white throne judgment. And I'm not going to get here, so I'm going to have to tell you, but one day I will get there, and I will show you scripturally that it's my job to preach to you the Word of God. And when I preach to you the Word of God, then God's Word begins to judge you. And you want the Word of God judging you now. You want that transformation to take place here. You don't want that transformation to take place up there. There is no transformation. If you get up there and there has not been a conversion... There is no hope. We're in the dispensation of grace. That's where this whole subject started. We're in the dispensation of the church. Right now is the time to repent. Right now is the time to obey the gospel. Right now is the time to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So, well, I'll do it after the rapture. No, it'll be too late. And I want to tell you, I'm challenging all of these preachers in this city that don't preach, repent, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I don't care how much schooling you have in your Reformation doctrine. I don't care how many after apostles that you call apostolic fathers. They're not apostolic fathers. Jesus said that this gospel is built on the 12 apostles and the 12 apostles and the 12 apostles... Not Tertullian, not the rest of them. I don't have time to go through all of them. But there's 12 apostles that were given. And he, they were chosen by Jesus Christ. And it's the gospel that they preached. And Peter preached it on the day that the Christian church was started. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you, my brother, my friend. Why aren't you preaching? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's all that's going to stand in the judgment day. Don't bring to me some Johnny-come-lately commentary of some great man in the 17th century that had a beef with the apostles and the epistles that they wrote. And don't come and tell me that Old Testament scripture is not important that we did away with it. The apostles didn't have a New Testament to preach out of. Everything the apostles preached was out of the Old Testament. There was no New Testament till some 90 years, maybe 100 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They preach Jesus out of the Old Testament. They preach these doctrines that I am teaching this morning out of the Old Testament. And so we see that the law of the Lord is perfect. Go back to Psalms 19. Verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord, I'll quote it, are true. The testimonies of the Lord. First Psalms. 19, not 119. There we go. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord. Look at this. The statutes of the Lord are right. The statutes, you say, I want to live righteous. Well, then obey the statutes of the Lord. Rejoice in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More are they to be desired are they than gold. Yea, much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. And by them, moreover, by them is thy servant warned. 
And in keeping these statutes, laws, and testimonies of God, there is great reward. Now, brothers and sisters, why do we have the problem with homosexuality in our world today? Let's go back to Deuteronomy 22 and 5. Because there are many people that have tried to argue the fact that this is just a, this is just a modesty issue. Well, no, it's not. It's not a modesty issue. It is a law of God issue. Man, it's quiet in here. How many of you have been around the world? Has anybody flown outside of the United States? How many has been outside of the United States? Raise your hand if you've been outside the United States. Have you ever had to go to the bathroom somewhere besides in the United States? Raise your hand if you've had to go to the bathroom. That's the first thing I learned when I went to Mexico. Donde esta el baño? How many of you realize that the universal sign of a man's bathroom is a man in a pair of pants? That's the universal sign. Now they'll try to change it. You watch. Because they're trying to destroy sexuality. Because sexuality is how God defines humanity. Anywhere you go, I've been to China. In China, I can't read Chinese. I can't read Mandarin. And I can't, what's the other one? What's the other language? There's two languages. What is it? Cantonese. I can't read Cantonese and I can't read Mandarin. But I'll tell you what. I've been in the airports in Hong Kong and I've been in the airports in Beijing and wherever else I've been over there. I don't know. I've been so many places I can't remember. And when I go the when I gotta go to the restroom, I carefully look at the signs. And it's really important because when you go in the men's restroom, there will actually be women in there cleaning the bathroom. Kind of freaks you out. I want to tell them, would you please go out till I'm done? But I can't. I don't know their language. So I go in the stall and I shut the door. Man, y'all are quiet. You act like this never happened to you. When I go to Mexico, I don't really, I didn't know when I first went. I know now, but I didn't know. And so I look for the universal sign of a men's restroom. I will be in Seoul, South Korea in just a few days. When I get there, the first thing I'll do is I'll go check in to the lounge of Delta. Because they have the most wonderful showers. And after 15 hours of flying, I'm going to take a shower and shave. I can't stand having a beard. I think that's a godly thing. Anyway. And, and so I look for the sign. I can't read Korean. But I can see the man on the sign. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to preach today. I come here to let hell know. What we are defining apostolic and separation from the world today we are defining it we're not ashamed of it now we don't hold it over people we're not going to be self-righteous look if you don't want to live this way you just live however you want to but i'm telling you i'm preaching to people that want to be who god called us to be i'm not preaching to people that are trying their best to be as close to the world as they can be and get away with it. I'm preaching to people today that are doing their very best to be everything that God has called us to be. That's not the kind of church and the kind of saints I want around here. And I don't believe that's the kind of saint you want to be. And so, I think you get the picture now. I've been to Africa. I've been to Uganda. I preached in a shack that was made out of corrugated steel in a rainstorm so hard though people couldn't even hear me while I was preaching. No bathrooms in that building. It would seat about 700 people. 
The bathrooms were out behind the building. They were very primitive. But they were not so primitive that they didn't have the universal sign of the men's bathroom, which is a man in a pair of breeches, and the woman's bathroom, which was a woman in a dress. Now, the Bible says that a lot of things nature teaches us. One of those is that God makes an important Distinction between the sexes. That is the moral law of God. How do you know that, Brother Elder? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 20. Oh, let's start at verse number, I don't know. In the image of God created he male and female. Is that Genesis chapter 3? Man, I lost all my shouters here. I thought we'd be running the aisle by now. Let's try 326. I don't know who's running that up there. Genesis 326. Is that it? I don't know because it's not up here. What is it? In the image of God created he. Surely somebody can find it. There's 200 people in this place. Y'all are just sitting there looking at me. Have you ever read your Bible? 326? Thank you. Who's running that up there? Thank you, Brother Reed. He finally woke up. So God created man in his own image. Look here. In the image of God created him male and female. There are no other sexes recognized in the eyes of God. There is not. Now, I used to know all the 56 different genders that nutso, insane people are trying to cram down the throats of our young people. I tell you this. If I was running for office, one of the platforms that I'd run on is if I catch you trying to do that to young people, you're going to jail. That is child abuse. I don't care if you like that or not. I'm not a politician. I'm a prophet. And I'm telling you that is child abuse. When you try to give hormone inhibitors to a child and they don't even know what's going on. I come to preach today. I come to preach about the law of God. I come to draw a line in the sand and say this is what this church stands for. Now look, we invite everybody to come. You can come, but I'm telling you, you're going to hear this kind of preaching around here. And I'll, I promise you, if you will obey the Word of God, you will live a life of joy. You will live a life of peace. You will live a life that is not full of confusion and despair and depression. You know why our kids today struggle with suicide? Because they don't have a certain sound. They don't see righteous judgment. They don't see a dad being a dad. They don't see a mom being a mom. And when they do see mom and dad, they're so wishy-washy. They don't have any kind of judgment in their life. And these kids need parameters, and they don't have them. I tell you something, mama. God didn't make you mama to be their best friend. God made you mama to be their mama. Well, they'll get mad at me. Of course they will. You're doing your job and they're doing theirs. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I had a father that guarded his house when I wanted to bring trash in that house. In fact, I snuck it in and he'd find it in my bedroom. He'd come in there like a 400-pound gorilla. What's this, son? What is this? Uh, uh, well, Dad, some of the girls bought that for me in junior high. You know, uh, uh, it's really nothing. What's it doing in your bedroom? You get that out in the trash can. right? But it's a gift. I don't care what it is. You get that out in the trash. You're not bringing that trash in this house. 
Oh, I thank God for a dad. He said, oh, oh, I can't believe he did that. I'll tell you this. He saved my soul. That's what he did. He was a father that was a good father. That stood in the door of his house and looked at the devil and said, you ain't bringing your trash in this house. You ain't bringing your doctrine in this house. You ain't bringing no spirits in this house. I can't tell you how many days I have thanked God for a father that was a father to me. Tell you what else I liked about him. I didn't find it in his bedroom either after he told me to get rid of it. Now, my daddy was an alcoholic before God saved him. And I'm telling you, when God saved him, he turned his back on the world. And he never went back. And one day I'm going to meet him. Because I want to live just like him. Brother Richard, come. There's no way I can get to all of this this morning. But it says here, in verse number 17 of 1 Peter chapter 4. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it first begin at us. What shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? See, you see the judgment of God as we align ourselves to the word of God. Now, the judgment of God is impartial. The judgment of God is unemotional. You say, well, God's mad at me. Well, how do you know? Well, because I disobeyed him. That's like you saying the judge is mad at you. The judge don't even know you. How many of you have spent one day in the courtroom? Raise your hand if you spent one day in a courtroom. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you have never been to court? Raise your hand if you've never been to court. There's a few of you. You're the smart ones. How many times have I told you, don't place your hands in the judgment of men because the judgment of men is corrupt. Let God judge you. But I've been in courtrooms. I've been in courtrooms where I've been in courtrooms where guys got mad and stood up and cussed the judge and he just looked at the bailiff, pointed, and off they went to jail for contempt of court. Because that judge in that courtroom, brothers and sisters, that judge has all power. He is very powerful. Now when he gets at home and he's barbecuing chicken, it's a different story. But when he's in that courtroom, he has tremendous power. Sister Carla, I don't know if it's still this way, but I, I've been in courtrooms in this city where if you are part of that court proceedings and you come in there and you're sloppily dressed, you will go to jail. Because he has a standard of dress to get in that courtroom. I don't know if they still do it. Hopefully some of them do. And if a man comes in there and he doesn't have a suit and tie on, he goes to jail. Well, I just don't think that's right. It really don't matter what you think. He's got the power to tell you whatever. So you either get over your entitlement high horse attitude or you go to jail. Some people in their entitlement amaze me. So what do you do, Brother Elder, before I go to jail? I carefully pay attention to what that judge wants. How many of you realize that this church just won a federal lawsuit? We just won a federal lawsuit. This was being played out in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver, Colorado. We won because the city abdicated. So, well, Brother Elder, they just settled. Well, they did more than settle. They paid court fees, court costs, attorney fees. That means we won. Not only that, 
we are allowed to do what we sued them to allow us to do. Now, that was not in deference to the laws of this city. And while we went through the whole court proceedings, when the judge would issue demands for this church, and our attorney would ask us for those demands, we were careful. In fact, I had a council of people in this church that were carefully compiling and putting together what that judge asked us for. I don't take it lightly. The whole decision process rests on us complying with the judgment of this man or this woman. Now, brothers and sisters, some of us are taking the salvation of our souls too lightly. And we're thinking, well, when we stand before God, after all, I'm only human. And, and it's just my nature, you know, and I, I just don't, I mean, I, I know the Word of God says that, but, you know, after all, He's a loving and He's a kind God. And here's one of the favorite ones you hear. Well, God is loving and God is kind. Surely all the rest of these people, they're not going to be lost just because they don't do what He said. Well, first of all, why are you worried about all these other people? If you're really sincere about living for God, why are you trying to live your life by the decisions of the trend and the crowd instead of living your life by obeying the Word of God? See, this judgment begins at the house of God, really starts way back in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 tells us the story of this. When we read this is the judgment of God against Jerusalem. This is where Peter got this reference. Ezekiel said, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand, does he have a sword or does he have a spear? Whatever he has. Now I know I preached a little longer than I should this morning, but I I don't know how to compete with the rest of the 40 hours you're going to spend on social media this week. Behold, six men came from the way of higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went and stood beside the brazen altar. That's the altar of repentance. That's the altar where they sacrificed the animal. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had a writer's inkhorn by his side. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations of my people. Now, brothers and sisters, if you don't think the word of God is important, and if you don't think that complying with the word of God is important, You have to understand this scripture. God is looking for those people that love his word. And he said if they love his word, then put a mark on their forehead. They cry for the abominations that are done in the midst. And I don't have time to go into the abominations. The abominations had got so bad that there were were people that were committing homosexuality that were priests. And they were setting up their temples right beside the temple of God. And they were practicing transgenderism. Transgenderism is not anything new. Transgenderism transgenderism has always been a part of idolatry. That's why a good, real preacher will preach against it, brothers and sisters. He will never embrace it. That wasn't the only thing. They had perverted the house of God. They They were living lives that were so contrary to the word of God. 
Next verse, please. And, and to others, he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. This is the word of God, brothers and sisters. This ain't Brother Elder. Don't have pity. Let me tell you, you don't want to be around when God meets out judgment against the sin of this world. And he said, slay utterly, old, young, maids, little children, women, but come not near any man upon whom the mark, upon whom is the mark. And where does this start? At my sanctuary. Remember, they started at the brazen altar. Where does this start? At my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain. Now, Brother Elder, did this happen? No, this is the vision that God gives to Jeremiah. But it's also a prophecy of what enemies were going to do to people that did not obey the law of God and the preservation of the people that did obey the law of God. And you see this. You see how that many of the children of Israel escaped the assassinations and the slaughter of Babylon and Assyria when Babylon came in to take them. Oh, they were taken into captivity, but they were preserved. And the ways of God were preserved. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that in this last day, you will see how that God will preserve those that fall in love with his word. Judgment begins at the house of God. I don't want to raise up a church around here where we allow all kinds of compromise and sin to go on in this church. Uh, I want God to fill this house with people. In fact, I pray every day I come into this church. Every day I come into this church and I walk and I lay hands on these pews and I pray every day. Some of you may have seen me do this, but I pray every day, God, you fill this church with people that are absolutely sold out to you. You fill this church with people that are radically yeah, emphatically sold out to you. People that love this one God message with all of their heart. People that love this Jesus name baptism message with all of their heart. People that love being filled with the Holy Ghost with all of their heart. Uh, people that love tithing and offering with all of their heart. People that love being faithful to the house of God with all of their heart. People that love holiness and separation from the world with all of their heart. God fill this house up. Why are you doing that brother elder because I'll find people that they'll come in here and they'll let the word of God judge them and when the word of God judges them now right here when they're baptized in Jesus name and they're filled with the Holy Ghost he takes all of the sin that is impugned to them and he puts it under the blood and he fills their life with his holy power and his blessing and his favor why would you want to return to the beggarly elements of the world after he has done that for you and has done that for me. And so carefully, let's stand. Carefully, we go through this and we teach. We teach. This is God's way. This is God's way. Why do women look like women in this church? Sis, if you're coming, you should be noticing that women don't wear men's apparel around here. You should be noticing that. And you should be asking yourself, oh, this city's full of women that want to make excuses. Have you seen the lesbianism in this city? Now, look, I love those ladies. I actually have much compassion for them. The sad thing is they never had a real man in their life to teach them real love. And I'm not just talking about the sensual sexual side. I'm talking about a father that would hold them in their arms. Teach them the intimacy of a father to a daughter. And the words of faith. And the words of compliment. Of how beautiful they are. Because one of the biggest tools that Satan has against women. 
is he will tell them how ugly they are. And he will tell them how unattractive they are. And he will tell them that you need the accruements and the cosmetics of the world to be pretty. And so it's so desperate that these young ladies need a father that says, No, you're beautiful. No, you're beautiful. You're precious. They've not had that. But I'll tell you this. If, if maybe you're fighting with that sin and you're here, just keep coming. You keep, long enough, you keep coming long enough. You're going to feel the love of your father. You're going to feel the love of a father that will never forsake you. You're going to hear the words of a father that will never leave you. I don't care if you're 15 or if you're 55. Uh, he will never leave you, sis. He will never forsake you. He loves you. You are precious to him. He said a book was written about you before you were born. See, I don't have time to preach all this in one morning. But I'm going to tell you something, sis. If you want to feel like the lady that he created you, there's nothing wrong with you putting on a beautiful dress. Combing that glory that God gave you. Did you know the angels of God are connected to your hair? That's why the Bible said don't cut it. Keep the scissors out of your hair, sis. The angels are looking carefully. They're watching. And they see. Go read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Brother Elder, I never heard that before. Isn't that a shame that there's preachers that have never taught this to you? Isn't that a crying shame that there are men that call themselves preachers that have never preached this to you? Now, I'm not knocking people today. I'm just preaching. I want those, I want those enemies that have followed my family. See, there's another side of this I didn't have time to get to this morning, but I want those enemies that have followed my family for generations. Until I come to the baptismal tank. And when I come to the baptismal tank, all of those enemies, they're drowned. Just like the children of Egypt were drowned in the Red Sea. Because judgment begins at the house of God. God will stop that. He'll stop that familial curse right there. Right when you be. That's what he said. He said that he would visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the fourth generation of those. But he said, I will stop it. Right there at those that love me. When you obey the voice of God, the judgment of God stops it right there. And the judgment of God declares, Brother Elder, I've been disobedient. What do I do now? What do I do? I, I've been disobedient. The Bible tells you right there. It says that your obedience will be avenged. Or your disobedience will be avenged by your obedience. Right now is the time to start. Right now in this church service. Right now. What are you doing, Brother Elder? I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is, this is, this is where God... This is where God decides who are His and who are not. Is that mark on you today? If you want to be a part of God's covenant people, why don't you just come on up here? Come on, it's not hard. Don't make rocket science out of it. Don't let the devil tell you it's hard. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. That's it, sister. Sister Carly.
Come on, brother. Come on, brother. Make that decision. church let's pray let's pray let's pray come on let's pray that's it in the name of jesus
Ghost is moving in this altar. Come on, brothers. Come on, let's go. Stop before God is finished. Hallelujah. Come on, that's a Holy Ghost. That's a Holy Ghost. That's a Holy Ghost, brother. That's a Holy Ghost, sister. Yes. That's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it. That's it. Ikalabaha Shandai. God. And remember the rest of that verse. A bruised reed will he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench. How far do we go with this, Brother Elder? We go with this till we see people 
that he has judged and victory is accomplished in their life. How many of you want God's victory? Now, there, there will be some, they'll reject it. There's nothing we can do about that. But I'll tell you this, there's also going to be those that they say, I'm going to be one of those that his mark is on me. I, how many of you want to be one of those that his mark is on you so that when the judgment passes by, it passes by your house, it passes by your marriage, it passes by your family. Come on, let's lift our hands and let's praise him like he's worthy to be praised before we leave this house today. Come on, everybody, let's fill this house with our voice of praise, with our voice of worship. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Praise God. This afternoon, right here at 2.30, our Spanish outreach service, God's going to move in a mighty way. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. Love one another. Again, this evening, church starts at 5 in the prayer room, or 5.30, and right here, 6 o'clock, worship, choir practice at 4.30. Love one another, you're dismissed.